Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Stephen Kotkin, the Kleinheinz Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the director of the Hoover History Lab. Our center director, the Revitalization of American Institutions, Director Brandis Keynes Roan, <clears throat> told me that there was a stellar panel on the military during the conference. And I said to her, oh, I will not miss that for anything. <laughs> and she said, correct. You're the moderator. <laughs> and I said, oh, OK. Uh, so uh, this is obviously invitation only. Our Thursday panel yesterday was a public event. The panels today are invitation only um, um, in, in this uh, day and a half conference. The trust in the military is quite high by US institutional standards. <clears throat> the June poll by Gallup had it at about 60%. That number uh, doesn't sound good, except if you ask, well, what about Congress? That's about 60 points higher than Congress. <laughs> what about the president? That's about 80 points higher than the presidency, and I could go on. The challenge, however, is that despite that high 60% trust in the military, the direction is not good. The trust has declined uh, for several years running. Uh, we're not at historic lows. 60% is by no means a rock bottom. For those of you who lived through the 1970s and, and Vietnam or who, who were there for the, um, the failed uh, hostage relief effort, uh, in the Carter presidency, you will know that that was our rock bottom in the modern era in terms of trust in the military. But still, it's worrisome that this great institution uh, is losing trust, even though trust remains high. So the challenge for us today is to talk about what we might do in regaining that trust, rebuilding that trust, rebuilding to the historic highs that we've seen in the military. And we have an extraordinarily distinguished panel today. Our first speaker will be uh, Secretary Mattis. Everyone knows Secretary Mattis. Uh, general Mattis, a four-star general, served in the Marines um, uh, and became the Secretary of Defense in the Trump administration. You'll know also his book, Call Sign Chaos, We'll now take a 15-second break for you to go on your phone, <laughs> Amazon, to make sure that you have a copy uh, coming to you shortly. And uh, he's an extraordinarily dedicated member of our Hoover community. Speaking after him is the National Security Advisor, H.R. Uh, McMaster. H.R. retired also from the military, Lieutenant General, after 34 years in the officer corps and a little bit longer as a rugby player, uh, <laughs> which he was at, at West Point. Uh, the general has written uh, Battlegrounds, which is, again, 15 seconds now for you to make sure that that's... Page Turner. Page Turner, what does he say? We know that, but we, they, they need to go on Amazon very quickly. <laughs> um, he's also the author of an important book, uh, The Vietnam War, Dereliction of Duty, and we, he's, he's at work on a book, I know, because we're floor mates in the tower on the 11th floor, uh, which we expect to see soon. Our third uh, panelist will be the Honorable Joni Ernst, the senator from Iowa, elected in 2015, and she chairs the Republican Policy Committee. She's a member of the Armed Services Committee as well, ranking member of the Small Business Entrepreneurship Committee, and Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. Uh, the senator was in the ROTC program at Iowa State University, and therefore has a very long relationship with the military. She too served, like uh, our other panelists, in Iraq and Kuwait. She led a, a company of National Guardsmen, Iowa National Guardsmen, during Operation Iraqi Freedmen. And she retired as a lieutenant colonel in the Iowa Army National Guard after 23 years of service. Our fourth and final panelist is like me, only better. 
<laughs> that is, he's an academic. Uh, Peter Fever, who's a professor at Duke and has had a very distinguished career, six books. He runs the Grand Stra American Grand Strategy Program at Duke and many other things. His most recent book, Thanks for Your Service, is about precisely the question that we're <coughs> speaking about today. And so if you want to know his bio in, in a single sentence, he wrote the book. I think also you should take this 15 seconds now while I'm blathering to pre-order. Pre no, it's, no it's out. In fact, not only is it out, can we see it? There you go. So he's got his copy. It's on you now to get your copy. So we could go on with the introductions, all the achievements, the, the, the medals, awards that everyone has won, but instead we'll go right into the substance here. The question for us, as I suggested, is what is the one thing you think we should do of the many things we could do in reversing this trend and instead increasing trust in our military today. As I said, we'll start with uh, Secretary Mattis. Well, thank you. Good to be here with all of you. Uh, the one thing, uh, to quote the great Marine, the senior Marine at Stanford for most of my years here, Captain George Schultz, uh, to trust is the coin of the realm. And I think what we have to look at is how do we maintain in the American people's minds that the US military is truly subject to civilian control. If we ever lose that, then we're gonna lose the whole thing. And so I, I would just point out, starting out here, that Go uh, Governor Sununu, uh, Governor Moore, Secretary Rice last night made the point about institutions must stand the test of time. And if you look at the U.S. military, critical to the support and defense of our Constitution, protection of our freedoms, uh, let me start with an amazing statistic. We have two and a half centuries. It's a record of the U.S. military never being a threat to our republic. Now, you may say, well, of course not. And yet that's not the norm in most places, and it was not necessarily how the Founding Fathers saw a standing military. I think there are three areas we have to look at. It won't surprise you that it's the military's role in restoring trust, it's the president's role, it's the legislature's role. And on the military role, I remember my first day in the military, I had hair that was somewhat longer than the senator's uh, for my first 40 <laughs> seconds before I fell under the tender mercies of Marine drill instructors sitting in the chair that disappeared, and in those 40 seconds, I was looking at a wall in front of me of these fierce-looking, crisply uniformed Prussian haircut sergeant majors, captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels, a general, and then up above was a row of people in civilian clothes, Secretary of the Navy, Secretary of Defense, President of the United States. From my first moment in the Marine Corps, through all the classes, we actually get classes on civilian control of the military, in the military, as young officer candidates, as young lieutenants, captains. It even happens when you're a colonel, you get the class. Uh, and I would just point out that I've, I've been through a grand total of three years of university level education. Uh, I've taken constitutional law, I've been through history courses, and other than hearing the word civilian control of the military, I don't require any long discussion about it. It's so much an accepted matter that we just take it for granted, I think, frankly. But the question here today is if we have 250 years almost of civilian control of the military, a little more than that if you count our Revolutionary War time under the Revolutionary Army prior to the Constitution, how do we build, that, build on that for the next 250 years? In terms of the military's role, I would just say that the lack of civics education today uh, and the way we teach history in many parts of the country, which breeds no affection for this magnificent experiment you and I call America, the military needs to double down on the classes it holds. It cannot assume that people coming in the military are imbued with a love of the Constitution or respect or knowledge, as the governors pointed out yesterday. Uh, if you can't, don't know something, you cannot defend that. 
I think two retired generals in particular, admirals, uh, need to go silent during elections. The American people do not need military officers uh, telling them how to vote or suggesting strongly how they vote. Uh, general Bradley, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a beloved Army general, said when admirals and generals retire their uniforms during elections, they should retire their tongues. And I agree yeah. with that 100%. Uh, we have to recall that the Founding Fathers said the military, a standing military, is necessary. It's also a potential threat to the Republic. And so I think if you look back at our Declaration of Independence, I'm wearing the tie with all the signers' names on it here. Uh, if you look back at that, they were military grievances that led us to that nasty argument with King George III. You're quartering your troops in our houses without our permission. You're giving them an independent role, these military guys superior to the civilian authority. We don't like it. So I think that uh, the military is responsible for making certain it teaches this, that we do not become a threat in any way to the people. The president's role, <clears throat> I think the president himself has a responsibility and to make certain he never uses the military to police the republic. We protect the republic, we do not police it. Uh, and I think too that the line has been crossed, uh, President Trump handing out MAGA hats to uniformed troops to put on, encouraging them to put them on when he was visiting bases. Uh, President Biden having uniformed Marines standing on the stage during a political speech. The president has a responsibility not to do that sort of thing. Uh, I would also point out we elect our commander in chief in this country. And right now the all volunteer force is in its biggest crisis in 50 years. <clears throat> it is hundreds of thousands, frankly, short. We keep changing the end strengths a little bit so it doesn't look quite as bad. But the US Army has missed its mission and in some cases had to lower its standards over the last 10 years. The Navy has missed its mission, the Air Force has. The Marines have not, but that is, that is, they take no refuge in saying we're good. They say it's coming. It's coming to the Marines. The Army walks point for all of us on this sort of thing. And so how many of you can recall the last time that President Obama, President Trump, or President Biden said, Uncle Sam needs you? I can't recall once. We leave it to a sergeant down in Illinois or Iowa or wherever to go out and sell the military. And that is not a way to keep trust with the American people. The last point, the legislature's oversight uh, is absolutely critical. I'm, I'm very reluctant to say much when we have one of the finest senators here <laughs> in terms of maintaining uh, the legislature's rightful role, uh, Senator, and you don't get enough uh, credit for it, frankly. But I would just point out that we are seeing in what Senator Tuberville is doing right now probably, for, I think it's for the first time in our history, such a violation of the oversight role that it's gonna take the Senate taking special steps more than likely to restore integrity to that. Also on funding, if you do not fund that military, it's hard for the military to maintain trust with the American people that we can do the job because we can start selling you on some bill of goods that yes, we can defend the country when in our heart of hearts, we know we cannot do that and a cavalier disregard for funding means we go to CRs. And what that means to you, when you hear the word CR, continuing resolution, you should know that means we're gonna waste your money for this year. That's what those words mean. Because we can't change anything from last year. Can you imagine if your family had some life-changing event, you were forced to spend the same amount on vacations, restaurants, and everything else, right on through the year, even if your medical bills had gone up or something? That's what we're doing to the military. That will break our trust with the American people when they see that level <coughs> of, uh, of a lack of managerial integrity. Uh, very, very important, I think, that, that when the officers are sworn, uh, we have to give our word to the Senate, that we will give our honest opinion, that when we give it, we stay out of politics and we make certain that we're not punished for doing that. The Founding Fathers recognized we had to have special rules. They told the Congress, you will make special rules for the military. Uh, they recognized that the civilian imperatives of a democracy might be out of step with the military imperatives of a battlefield. 
and yet sometimes we have people with no military background trying to impose civilian imperatives that actually endanger mm -hmm. our young men and women on the battlefield. That cannot be allowed to go on because when you're going into a family and telling them what is most beloved by them, whether their son or their daughter is dead, and when it starts being revealed that they weren't properly trained, weren't properly equipped, that will break trust. But here's my key point. Uh, starting with George Washington at Newburgh, when he absolutely throttled his officers to think they could confront the Continental Congress for breaking their word, and they did break their word to, the, to these officers. Uh, he, thought, he said, you will not do this. We are on probation in front of the whole world that our military will never do this and we remain on probation today. He set the trajectory, but as the great Dr. Corey Shockey, uh, the, one of the brightest strategists uh, in the Western world today, uh, puts it, the Congress and the President have the right to be wrong, objectively and strategically wrong. That does not relieve the military from obedience to all lawful orders. A final point I'll make on that, I said lawful orders, uh, in the military, it's not just illegal to carry out an unlawful order, it is illegal to give the order. If somebody tells me to do something in the military, and I know it's illegal, if I give the order for someone else to do it, even if they don't do it, I am now subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That's court-martial. So there is also a value in the institution to retain your trust that says they will not carry out illegal orders if they're given it. And they cannot even give the order. It doesn't matter if it's carried out. Back over to you, Steve. Thank you, Secretary Jim. Really uh, brilliantly setting the table. I like the fact how you hide really what you think. <laughs> right. Straight forward and tell us. Uh, we parsed it out anyway somehow, but brilliantly setting the table for us. Uh, General HR, maybe you could build on that yeah. in your remarks, please. Well, for, first of all, thanks for this amazing program here at Hoover and the opportunity to be on this panel with people I admire tremendously. And I would just build on what uh, Jim Mattis said in terms of the, the importance of the military and the military's role in, in preserving our professionalism, our professional military ethics, civil control of the military, respect and the covenant with the American people, to say that our political leaders have that responsibility as well. So the one thing I would say is to, for our political leaders to focus on what the military is for and preserve our warrior ethos, uh, and to stop trying to politicize the military or distract the military. That's a long one thing, but they're all related to one another. And I think what, we've, what we have seen is a distraction in many ways of what, about what the military is for. Mm -hmm. I think if you read our current secretary's priorities from each of the services, you might wonder, like, remind, what, the Army, what is the Army for again? Is it for you know, bat, batting climate change? Is it, you know, do we really need to change the culture in the military? Is, is the military, is the Army's culture the problem um, in, in connection with some of the maladies that we see in, across all the services? But, but I believe the culture is, you know, fundamentally hostile uh, to, you know, to bigotry, racism, sexism, and, and, uh, and various forms of misconduct. And so I think there's this distraction uh, about what the military is for. I think that is one of the reasons why we see problems with recruiting. But I think what we're seeing is the erosion of the warrior ethos associated with that distraction, but also associated with efforts to politicize the military. And this goes kind of across the political spectrum. Uh, Secretary Mattis mentioned a couple of the behaviors associated uh, with that. But I think too often, many of our politicians have tried to drag the military into the same sort of polarization we see in, in our society. And I'll talk about you know, three or four ways that this is, this is occurring. But first, I'd like to just maybe talk about the warrior ethos, what it is, and why it's so important to preserve. The warrior ethos is, is really a covenant. It's a covenant, and Jim has already alluded to this, between the American military and the people. It's, it, is, it, is, it is formed on, on, on trust and an understanding of the military's role uh, to protect our society and to protect our society based on the, the orders and directions from our civilian authorities. But it's also a covenant between warriors between warriors who are bound together by a sense of, of common purpose, mutual respect, and a sense of honor and adherence to principles, especially courage and willingness to self-sacrifice. Willingness to sacrifice for one another and willingness to sacrifice for those in whose name we fight and serve. I believe that that ethos 
is under duress. It's under duress because a lot of Americans don't understand the military and the importance of the, of the ethos. And they don't understand it because we get our information about the military less and less from people who we know who serve mm -hmm. and more and more from popular culture, which tends to coarsen and cheapen the warrior ethos. And I'm talking about movies and, you know, and, and video games and, and other elements of, of popular culture. So we don't know very much about why our warriors serve, why they're willing to sacrifice, what is the nature of their calling. And then compounding that, I think, are often very well-meaning organizations that portray our veterans as traumatized, mm -hmm. fragile human beings and create in, 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 our, in the minds of many of our, uh, of, of, our, uh, of our people that service in the military is gonna mess you up. When in fact, as we know, even those who have experienced the most harrowing conditions of battle, like Secret Captain Schultz did, for example, uh, in, in World War II, they emerge from that experience stronger and go on to make significant contributions to our society in, 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 other, in other walks of, of life. So popular culture and the sense that our, our veterans are traumatized, fragile human beings. The third, I think, is our political leadership's failure to commit to winning in war. And I think that this has an element of strategic incompetence associated with it and an inability to connect what we're doing militarily to the achievement of political aims that brought us into that war to begin with. One of the things that particularly irks me is that how even some of our general officer colleagues have taken up this phrase, responsible end of a war, right? And I've said this before, but you know, I used to box, you know, in, in a much lower weight class, by the way, you know. <laughs> but but, but, I, but, I, but I, I never got into a boxing ring and said, I just want to bring this to a responsible end. <laughs> Because you're going to get your ass kicked, right? You're going to get your ass kicked. So, so you know, in, in war, each side tries to outdo the other, right? And we have to have a commitment to winning. And our, I think our political leadership should be as committed to winning as our servicemen and women. And right. I think the true test of strategy is, can that platoon leader explain to his or her platoon mm -hmm. how the risks that they're taking and the sacrifices they may make on a mission are contributing to an outcome worthy of those risks and sacrifices. And here I think there's a direct correlation between the humiliating surrender and withdrawal from Afghanistan and the reduction in our recruiting numbers. Mm -hmm. the third, the, and the other aspect of this, uh, of this I think, disappointment and, and, uh, and maybe dragging the military into to politics is how current political appointees in this administration in particular are pushing reified philosophies associated with post-colonial, post-modernist critical theories that are trying to teach our service men and women mm -hmm. that you shouldn't judge the Marine next to you based on their courage, their toughness, their commitment to the mission each other. You should judge them by their identity category. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing that is more destructive to unit cohesion and combat effectiveness than that. And so I think we, we do have to, certainly within our military, preserve our professional military ethic and order ethos. But I think it's really important at, the, at this time for us to lay that expectation on our politicians. Stop trying to politicize the military. There's a narrative that feeds on each other across the political spectrum, right? What do you hear? What do you hear in some, on maybe the far right or whatever it is, you know? The military is woke. On the far left, the military is extremist. Hey, our military is not woke. It's not extremist. And when you put those narratives out there, it shouldn't be a surprise that the Army has 10% fewer white males volunteering for service. That's the demographic that matters right here. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about that. But it's that politicization of the military that has affected a demographic in our country in a way that they don't see the rewards of service that await them uh, if they enlist or seek a commission in our armed forces. Thank you so much for that, General. Um, Senator Ernst. How does it look to you? How can we build on those first two comments? Well, I, I could make this easy and just say ditto, <laughs> uh, because I, I agree completely uh, with what's being sat, uh, said already. Um, I'll add just a little bit more, but it does keep in, in theme 
with what HR and Jim have already said. Um, and I'll start with and build upon the wokeness in the military issue. And the, the original question is why does uh, the public not trust our military mm -hmm. as much as they used to? And we have seen a significant drop. Uh, the wokeness, now you hear that a lot. But I have been pushing back on this because that is coming from people not in the military. Mm -hmm. It's coming from outsiders that are looking in and describing the military as woke, not by actions coming from the men and women that are actually wearing the uniform, but by political appointees, those civilians that are in charge of the military. So I'll, I'll use an example. Um, you mentioned climate change um, as one of the goals for our military to combat. Um, I'm sorry, when I served, that was not a goal that I, I was working towards. Uh, I always thought our military was to be the most lethal fighting force on the face of the planet. Um, I think that's why we were uh, put into being. But one of the uh, goals in this administration has been to uh, completely transition all non-tactical vehicles in the military's fleet to electric. Okay, um, that great goal, and to do that in the next few years. And I'm not gonna knock you if you wanna drive an electric vehicle, that's great. But I can tell you, you're not driving through a combat zone. Okay, so, and again, this was the non-tactical vehicle fleet. But the goal was to build and continue with the non-tactical vehicle fleet to electrify the entire force. So I was a transportation company commander. So I led those convoys that were driving up into Iraq. And I can never in a million years imagine 60 of my vehicles towing cargo up into Iraq desperately looking for a charging station, <laughs> okay? No, no way, no how. The technology has a long way to go before I would ever entrust my men and women in electrified vehicles in a combat zone. Um, so that, that is a goal right now, not to make sure that we have the best technology available to keep our men and women safe, but to appease those that might be on the fringes of various ideologies. Okay, again, we need to be a lethal fighting force. That's why the American public looks at our military and says, wow, they are woke. But it, those are decisions not being made by the men and women in uniform. Those are the decisions being made by civilian leadership. Um, I think we do have to be careful when we talk about wokeism in the military and redirect our comments to the fact that maybe the civilian leaders don't fully understand why we have a military. You know, they, they maybe don't like the idea of engaging in war. And what was that end? What was that phrase? A responsible end. A responsible end? Right. Okay, <laughs> no, um, that's, that's not the way I see the military, um, especially when it comes in defense of our own nation and our people. I wouldn't be asking for a responsible end to protect the people that I know and love and represent here in the United States of America. It would be a con conclusive um, finish, okay, uh, to protect the people of the United States. That's, that's what we have to have. But I would encourage everyone, as we're talking about wokeism in the military, not to phrase it like that, please. Um, I served in uniform. My daughter now serves in uniform. Uh, she is on active duty, uh, and I encourage that, and I'm glad that she does. Um, but I don't like it when, when people from the outside will point the finger and say, you're a woke military. I can tell you my daughter's not woke. She is a hardworking uh, young soldier. She loves what she does, and she's committed to our great United States of America. Uh, so I think that that is one issue, is too often we throw terms around casually, and eventually it does hurt the public trust in that institution. So I would just caution us on that. Um, the leadership is very important. The civilian leadership, um, you must uh, lead by example. 
and that needs to occur in the military as well. And I think too often today, our moms and dads and just general public out there, when they look at leadership, they don't see the type of leadership that they feel will actually lead and do good for our nation. Uh, in the Army, the, and I'll paraphrase, but the definition of leadership or a leader is someone who will inspire others towards a common goal or objective for the good of the unit or the organization. Inspire. And when our public looks at military leaders who have become political, when they look at political leadership that they don't feel has the military's best interests at heart, they're, they're not inspiring. And trust is lost. So I think wokeism, I think leadership, um, and I do think, and HR, I'm glad you brought this up because this is something I was going to comment on as well, is that too often the public sees the uh, quote unquote endless wars that we have engaged in, and I'll, I'll mention the global war on terrorism in particular, uh, that has left a number of our military men and women um, with injuries that they will have the rest of their lives. So whether they've lost a limb, maybe they've suffered from traumatic brain injury, those are things they'll live with a long time. And when we don't take care of our veterans, um, and that's on Congress, okay, when we don't take care of our veterans, um, why would the public trust the military? If we're not gonna be doing right, by the very ones we put into harm's way. So I think there are so many things that we need to work on, and it's not just Congress, but it's the, the nation as a whole on how we address these issues. Uh, but uh, you know, I would just leave you with this, that we've got incredible men and women that serve in uniform. You know, they're not extremists, they're not woke. They are just Americans that love our country so much that they chose to stand up and raise their right hand. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful for everyone that chooses to serve. Um, to Peter, I know I haven't read your book yet. I'm looking forward to it. I can but, help you with it. Yes, yeah. and, I, and I know where to go on Amazon <laughs> to get it. <laughs> but um, you know, when, when we say thanks for service uh, or thanks for your service, one, one thing that I like to do um, when people say it to me is just to turn it back on them and say you're worth it. That also is part of the equation, is that mm -hmm. we need to educate people on the fact that we do live in the greatest nation on the face of the planet. Our country is worth it. And our men and women in uniform need to understand it. Um, and I think by all working together, then we'll develop greater trust in our military and the institution. Thank you, Senator, very well said. Professor Peter, you. You've decades of research. You served in the National Security Council. How does it look to you? What's the way forward for us uh, based upon your Well, experience? thank you, and I want to begin with some thanks. I want to begin by thanking Duke Medical School for teaching Senator Rand Paul the Heimlich Maneuver, oh, yes. <laughs> which uh, allows me to do this, to give you this. Thank so you. thank you, Duke Medical. I, I also want to thank... Uh, you may donate to him at any time. <laughs> I also want to thank um, uh, uh, Hoover stalwart oh, Bob great. Oster, who uh, invested in the research, made the research possible that's in that book. That's amazing. Thank I'll you. just point out uh, for the academics in the room that he, he gave a very generous gift in December. Uh, and in March, he emailed me and said, how's the book coming? So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm afraid it took me several years before I had a good answer <laughs> for that, that email. But um, I do encourage you to look at it. It's a great gag gift as, if you get it as an audio book, because it has <laughs> 160 tables and figures. And the poor guy reading the audio book <laughs> has to read each one of those oh, no. uh, tables. So um, it's, it's worth it. The, the bottom line about the book is that public confidence is high, but hollow. That is, it's high relative to the other institutions, as we know from uh, what Steve said and we've heard earlier this morning. But it's hollow because the drivers of it are likely to go down rather than up. It, it's driven up when you're at war. There's a rally to the flag. We're not at a traditional war frame now. It's driven by close connections to the, Amer to the military. But as HR mentioned, 
those connections are, are, are dwindling. So we no longer have the greatest generation, the World War II generation, where everybody had somebody in mm -hmm. their family that served. We're seeing a passing of the draft era and Vietnam generations where many, many Americans did. And increasingly, we recruit into the new all-volunteer force children of the old volunteer force. So that's a smaller and smaller dwindling uh, um, a fraction of the American people have a connection. And there's a, a great book that uh, Secretary Mattis and Corey Shockey wrote uh, f a couple of years ago that addressed this gap mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. detail. This is, this is going to drive down public confidence in the military just inexorably because of these factors. It's hollow also because it's propped up by social desirability bias. It turns out people say they have confidence in the military because in part, some people, because that's what they believe is the correct answer to give. And when you use survey techniques that are meant to tap into latent attitudes, that uh, confidence, their actual confidence, drops 8 to 27 points. So there's a hollowness there mm -hmm. that suggests that different moves, if the permission space changes, then you could see a dramatic drop. And I would point to a changed permission space as of mid September 2020, which I think uh, Secretary Mattis will remember, because this is a moment when the uh, President of the United States and the leading Republican candidate, I mean, the, the Republican candidate for President and Commander-in-Chief attacked, by name, some re senior military who had served in his administration and argued that the military uh, senior generals wanted to go to war because they wanted to sell arms, et cetera. You, the, and that created a permission space for Republicans to look at the military differently. Then that got echoed in the woke military critique that you mentioned, Tucker Carlson, other prominent Republican opinion leaders messaging a very different message about the military. That allows for that social desirability bias to be popped. And I think much of the drop in the last several years can be explained just with re respect to that. So high but hollow, and, and of course it is, as HR has said, threatened by the politicization of the military. And that's a, a big concern. I have one more thing to say about that at the end. We should care about this. So this is my second point. We should care about public confidence in the military because it correlates with other things we care about. It, it does make recruiting harder. When public confidence goes down, that's fewer people recommending to others to serve in the military. It, so people with higher confidence recommend to others to serve. And the recruiter's job, which is already extremely difficult because of the labor market, is that much more difficult when public confidence goes down. And it's also correlated with high willingness to spend more on defense, so providing the resources that the, the military needs. It's not an unadulterated good. So high public confidence can lead to pedestalization, putting the military on a pedestal and saying, you are better than the rest of society. That's why I love your response to thanks for your service. You're worth it. It's a reminder to the military not to look down from the pedestal on the American society. And also, it's a warning to the American people, don't put them on a pedestal that you will then knock off and ignore. Pedestalization can lead to alienation in either direction. So what I call for is not lower confidence in the military, but rather deservedness of high confidence mm. by doing some of the measures that Secretary Mattis and uh, General McMaster and S Senator Ernst suggested, and then propping up public confidence in the other institutions that for them to deserve higher confidence too. That's the solution, not driving down the military and knocking them down a peg. What are the things that the rest of us can do? Well, I have one modest proposal here, and it's a version of what HR suggested. I want us to sh cultivate the norm that gives the uniformed military non-combatant immunity in the culture wars. <laughs> that is, they are non-combatants in the culture wars. The, the hold you mentioned with Senator Tuberville, there's a legitimate policy dispute at the root of that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's reasonable for a uh, pro-life uh, caucus to be concerned about the policy choice made by uh, Secretary Austin. And I think Secretary Austin had the authority probably and under the 
OLC's ruling did have the authority to make the choice. That's a policy fight, has a culture war element. That fight should be made by civilians. Yes. The military should have non-combatant immunity. So that requires one party to stop targeting the military. It requires another party to stop hiding behind the military, stop asking the military to carry the water for issues that are uh, controversial, but if you could get a military panache around it, a, a uniform, wrap it in a uniform, it's a little easier to sell. Uh, and crucially, it requires the military to talk about their values in ways that do not make them sound like culture warriors. And this is hard because the, the culture war language industry moves at warp speed. Uh, there might even be a Moore's Law about uh, <laughs> yeah. it that is operating. And the military training moves at the speed of glaciers. And so you train up senior military leaders on the proper language that was acceptable a couple of years ago. That language might be triggering today. Mm. So the military needs to recruit across all walks of life in America. We have to recruit from all corners. And we need to bring them together and forge a cohesive fighting force that is mission focused. What I just described, I think everybody in the room would agree with that. That's what some people mean, and that's what some senior military mean when they say diversity, equity, inclusion. But if you use that phrase today, it signals, it triggers a totally different understanding. And so you have to talk about your values if you're military without sounding like culture wars. Stop targeting, stop hiding, stop sounding like a culture war. Finally, just to reinforce what Secretary Mattis said uh, about the importance of the public understanding civilian control. The public does not understand what is meant by civilian control does, and does not understand how precious is that. It's a very dispiriting finding that's reproduced by me and many others who do this work, that the public does not know what good civil military norms looks like. And they're not asking and holding the military accountable and holding political leaders accountable to the proper norms. We need to improve civics education. And, and Secretary Mattis has made a, a contribution here. He all, and, and all but one of the retired secretaries of defense and then all but one of the retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff wrote an open letter uh, published in September of 22 that says, here are the fundamental principles of civilian control. This is the grading rubric. Apply it to our record, apply it to the current team, then the current team would be Million Austin. And let's have every future uh, general and flag officer be held accountable to this understanding of civilian control. This is what it means, not what you're hearing on cable TV. And I think if we push those kinds of forms of civic education, I think we can chip away at this. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. We're going to come back to the panel. They're going to want to comment on each other's uh, comments. I just want to get the room involved as much as possible. This is the Hoover Institution. So we have active military uh, members here in our audience. We have veterans in our audience. We have not only generals up here on the podium, uh, on the dais, but we also have admirals in the audience. I'm going to take this opportunity to turn to one of our admirals. Yes, the Marines are technically Navy, but let's be <laughs> they'll honest. Never, they'll never admit it. Let's really be honest about that. Uh, Senator, uh, we're the men's department. That's right. <laughs> I want to bring the Navy in if I could. Uh, uh, Admiral uh, James Ellis, Jr. Thanks to this wonderful panel, I, I certainly, you know, is probably the guy who's been out of uniform the longest, want to associate myself with the remarks that I've heard so far. And, and, and first amongst them is the point that Secretary Mattis made, is that uh, the military needs to, uh, to conduct itself that it's deserving of the trust that uh, it receives from the nation. That's absolutely essential, and I would argue that it is deserving of that. I mean, it's got challenges, and we've talked about them on the recruiting side, but it is the most combat-experienced military in the world. Uh, it's the most combat-experienced military this nation has ever had. And in terms of capacities to deter aggression on the part of uh, others, uh, we need to continue to expand on, on that and give them the materials that they, that they need. But I, I would also agree with uh, Senator Ernst that, and, and Peter Fever that you know, this politicization has gotten out of hand. I mean, uh, it's, you see senior officers being 
uh, in, in exercising the accountability that Secretary Mattis described in civilian accountability or oversight of the military, uh, that you see military leaders being pressed with questions that are carefully uh, constructed so as to force uh, one of those when did you stop beating your wife kinds of answers that, uh, that put the, uh, the leaders in a, in a milieu where they're quite frankly they're not experienced and they're not comfortable. And uh, you know, I always remember that uh, George Washington uh, once said that uh, you know, uh, it's better to be alone than to be in bad company. But unfortunately, our military leaders don't have that option. They have to appear in front of, of Congress and the like, and, uh, and, and they don't have the option. And, uh, somebody once said, misery loves company. And of course, with the Congress, with apologies to, uh, to Senator Ernst, hovering at 8% approval rating in that poll that, uh, uh, that Peter Fever quoted, uh, misery loves company, and the, and the senior military doesn't have the opportunity of declining the invitation, uh, in a sense. So you, you've got to go, and they need to be more skilled, as, as the senator has so powerfully said, in, in, in navigating those, uh, those conversations. But uh, you know, I also think that at the, uh, at the end of the day, these things will go full circle. And uh, we don't want the U.S. or the American people to be challenged, uh, particularly in our leadership role that is so important in the, uh, uh, in the international community. But I'm reminded of that last verse from, the, uh, from the, the Kipling poem, Tommy, where it's Tommy this and Tommy that and throw him out the brute, but he's savior of his country when the guns begin to shoot. And so we've, we don't want that to be the restorative force uh, we need to find a way to, to move back to a, to a dialogue that extricates the military from the inappropriate political conversations that they're increasingly being dragged into, and I think that's an important uh, dimension of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Admiral. We have a very distinguished professor here who likes to say that if nobody raises their hand, she'll call on them, but she just saved me from that by raising her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Rice, can we pass the mic up here, uh, Tom? <laughs> well, thank you for a really wonderful panel, and uh, I especially want to thank Senator Ernst uh, for being here and Peter for coming across the country. Uh, can you speak to the role of the military academies? and where we are now with the military academies. Uh, that is a place mm -hmm. that there has been a lot of concern about what is taught in the military academies, uh, what is expected of mm -hmm. uh, the military academies. So um, can pick any of them. You can pick West Point, Annapolis, mm -hmm. or, or the Air Force Academy. But just what do you think is happening there? Yes, and th thank you for that, Secretary. Uh, the concern that I have, again, is that we are projecting thoughts from the outside into organizations. And we have heard many times over the last couple of years that the military is woke. They're teaching woke classes at the academies. And so my daughter did graduate from West Point. And so I often, when I heard of these classes being taught at West Point, I asked her, like, okay, Libby, tell me about these classes that are being taught at West Point. She's like, I've never been to any of those classes. So I think there's a lot of misinformation that gets pushed out there, or it could be maybe they have a sharp day, which is sexual harassment um, training, uh, how to report it, things like. So maybe they're going through a class on sexual assault, sexual harassment, um, and somebody somewhere might view that as woke classes that they're forced to go to. Um, so I think, again, it comes down to terminology and how we're phrasing it and actually knowing before we start challenging these institutions, really knowing and understanding what is it that you are doing um, and teaching our young men and women um, but again, going back to the, the overall issue of, of the military and how we carelessly toss around a woke military, uh, I will share with you, and I, and I hate this, I sat down a week and a half ago to go through the academy packets that come forward as senators uh, and congressmen. We nominate, we have so many nominations we can give uh, to students in our states for the academies, the service academies, the Naval Academy, uh, the Air Force Academy, and uh, the Military Academy at West Point. 
I normally have between 60 and 90 applications every year. Mind you, Iowa is a very sparsely populated state, but 60 to 90, that's kind of typical. This year, 33. Mm. Wow. 33 applications. These are some of the finest four-year institutions that we have in, in the United States. And it's concerning to me. And if we continue on this path, especially for these incredible um, academies, if we continue, I, I don't know what we're going to do, but it's, it really is a signal to me that we have got to do better. We have got to figure this out. I'm glad we're having this discussion today. We're gonna to continue this discussion at the Reagan National Defense Forum. Mm -hmm. We've gotta figure this out because we have incredible young men and women that want to serve, but maybe are being discouraged into not serving. And so um, uh, collectively, we need, we need as the United States to figure this out. General HR, I know you've recently been re-engaging uh, with, with West Point where your alma mater. Give us some insight on what you well, saw. I mean, just to tout my bipartisan credentials, I got fired by two presidents, <laughs> President Trump, and then President Biden fired me from the board of, of visitors at West Point uh, as he got rid of all Trump uh, appointees, which I think was a mistake. Trump didn't do that to Obama uh, appointees, for, for example. So uh, just a, a small, insignificant example, but you know, I could be a great voice for West Point being on the inside with the board of visitors and, and saying, hey, it's not happening. But I am concerned, again, about civilian leadership trying to push it on the academy. Mm -hmm. I think some of the problem has been with right. guest lecturers who are brought in, exactly. who are proponents of various critical theories or, mm -hmm. you know, to be anti-racist, you have to be racist. I mean, the Ibrahim Kendi kind of arguments. And, and I think that, you know, while we, our students have, ought to be aware of that and universities are an opportunity to expose people to a whole broad, broad range of views, I don't think that's the kind of, you know, philosophy Mm -hmm. that, that our military should endorse, for example. I recently saw an advertisement uh, for professors of history written by a civilian professor of history at the history department. And what concerned me the most was not how they were seeking professors who had done their research in very narrow areas of minority studies that, you know, that are important. But of course, how about an American historian who can talk about the black experience in, in America and, 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 you know, and the evolution from slavery to, to the present rather than someone who is a specialist in one particular area. I mean, I didn't really care about that as much as the description of West Point as a small elite liberal arts college <laughs> with about 4,000 students. And I thought, who the hell in their right mind would write that description, you know? And so, so I, I just think, I think that again, uh, I have tremendous faith in the superintendent of West Point. Mm -hmm. The dean at West Point was one of my old lieutenants. I'm telling you, the academy is in great shape overall. It just, it's important just to recognize there are these kind of pressures, mm -hmm. right, to, mm -hmm. to drag it into, as Peter said, give them immunity, man. I mean, mm -hmm. give them immunity from it. Protect them from it. The cadets I know, and I, I kind of mentor a little bit the rugby team there at West Point, who lost to Navy in, in extra time. Uh, Navy's got an amazing team. I think, I think Navy's gonna win the national championship again this year. And I root for, Na I, I root for Navy all but one time, you know, in, in the year when they play Army and go Army beat Navy this weekend, football. So, but the, but the, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the word ethos is alive and well there. Um, I just wrote the forward to a really neat book uh, called, called Brothers, which is about uh, the class of 2002 rugby team at West Point and, and how that team went on uh, to, to serve and to make sacrifices uh, uh, after, the, after the attacks of 9-11. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and you can't help read that book, but just think how fortunate we are to have young men and women who volunteer to serve our country. And, and so I feel really good about it, Stephen and, and, and Madam Secretary. You know, I, 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 I think that we're in good shape but those pressures do exist, uh, and we have to help, I think, help the academies in a positive way, mm -hmm. right? Uh, help them get grant, be granted immunity from this. Can I add a word? Yeah. Yes. It would be wrong for the military academy to teach critical race theory, and thankfully, they do not. But it's not necessarily wrong for them to teach about 
critical race theory. Yeah. In, and when my Republican, uh, fellow Republicans ask me about that, I say, one reason they have to do it is because they're asked by you in congressional hearings about critical race theory. And the senior generals will come to me and say, what the hell is that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> they may have to be briefed on what this thing is because it is in the political ferment. And so there was one course, an advanced American politics course at the military academy that taught one week the key readings of critical race theory, and the second week, the key readings critiquing critical race theory. For advanced students in American politics, that's a reasonable, Absolutely. I think, exposure. You know, I study this military. Yeah. Uh, Secretary Rice can identify with this, and she's a specialist in this area. There was a Marxist military, and they spent all their time teaching Marxism yes. to them. <laughs> They didn't really teach them how to shoot. They didn't put them into uh, physical fitness stuff. But they were haranguing them about Marxism classes. At Kulak, bourgeoisie, imperialism, you know, all the stuff that they teach here in the humanities at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then there was a war scare. There was a war scare. And, and this document came in, which was commissioned by the guy in charge. And he commissioned the document about readiness and et cetera. And the document was done by the secret police on the military. Uh, and it was not a positive evaluation of their readiness should Great Britain attack as the war scare indicated might be a possibility. And so what did he do? This guy who's known to be a bit on the brutal side and, and not really um, a humanitarian, uh, he decided he was going to increase their military training. He was going to cut some of the political commissars out of the loop, reinforce discipline, make sure the officer corps knew military doctrine. And so the guy who was in charge of Marxist ideology globally, his name was Joseph Stalin, he had a panic over the lack of preparedness over his military in the late 1920s, and he launched both on the industrial side and on the training side, uh, lethality, a real military combat, and ability to fight. And when I first saw that document, I said, you know what? We need that document now. <laughs> we need that same process to happen. You know, Secretary Mattis, you know this well. That was your call sign in, in, in many ways in terms of the policies that you tried to implement, right? Get, and so the purpose of the military is really what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Why do we have, we have a military so that we don't have to use it. Mm -hmm. But if we do have to use it, it better be good. Mm -hmm. It better be able to do it. Social engineering doesn't help that much when the shooting starts. And if, 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 if the guy that I'm talking about could figure that out, well, I think we can figure that puppy out too. <laughs> Let's get two questions from the audience here. Yes, uh, uh, let's take them uh, sequentially. We'll wait for the microphone. I was wondering if you could comment on the use of private contractors in the military and HR to you specifically after your discussion of the warrior ethos, whether or not the use of private contractors has any effect or erodes or uh, that warrior ethos? Thank right, private you. contractors, next please, right over here. Senator Ernst, it's really exciting to have you on the panel. And I, I want to ask specifically to you, because you served in the National Guard, mm -hmm. what role the National Guard and to some extent the reserves play in this trust dynamic between the U.S. military and the U.S. public, Good. especially since they are your citizen airmen, your Absolutely. citizen warriors. You bet. Thank okay, you. Okay, so we got the private contractors, we got the National Guard, we got potentially one more, and that would be it before we go to the panel for a final word. I see. Hey, that was the awesome Jackie Schneider, by the way, <laughs> who's a phenomenal scholar and also an Air Force officer. All right, thank you so, for So just so you know her background. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we got many other people I know want to ask questions, but but let's uh, let's begin with Senator Ernst on the National Guard, and then let's sure. come back down Murderer's Row here. Yeah, ab absolutely, me. and thank you. And I served in both the Army Reserves and the Iowa Army National Guard, retiring out of the Iowa Army National Guard, and I think, and I haven't seen the specific polling, and, and maybe Peter would know different, but uh, because we have National Guardsmen and reservists out in our communities more so, and, and Iowa is a little different because Iowa is the only state in the United States that does not have either an active duty military installation or Coast Guard station. We are the only state. So our communities, however, are filled with incredible National Guardsmen. And in my own experience, I served and commanded the same company that my father had served in as a sergeant mechanic um, way back in the day. Uh, I served with a soldier that had enlisted the same, the same month that my father enlisted in that unit. Um, he actually, the soldier gentleman actually deployed with us, but had to retire when he got, got back. We had cousins uh, that served in my command. I had a husband-wife team that served overseas in my command. I had twin brothers that served in my, so you get the, the picture. This is rural Iowa, and because there are guardsmen that come from the rural areas, they serve together, they're out in their communities, they participate in parades, they're doing open houses at the local armories, um, they're pitching in when there's a veteran's funeral. People see them. They are their neighbors. Um, they are their friends. And the trust and confidence I feel in our reservists and National Guardsmen, at least in Iowa, are pretty darn high. It's pretty mm. darn high. Uh, right now, and I went back and specifically talked to our Iowa National Guard recruiters, both Air Guard and Army Guard. And what we have found with the National Guard right now is that the highest numbers of recruiting are coming from the rural areas. There is a much higher level of patriotism in our rural areas, and those are their words. The patriotism in the rural areas is, is higher than what they're finding from young men and women in the more metro areas. And we don't have many metro areas in Iowa, but they're large in part pulling their numbers out of the rural areas. Um, they are also finding great significance, uh, great, no, greater numbers of recruiting coming from green card holders in yeah. Iowa. Mm -hmm. And what you find um, common theme there is that uh, the, the patriotism in the rural areas, very high, they want to serve their nation, their state, and they see that they are valued in these, in these units and by their communities. Their mission is a little different than active duty. They're there to protect the local populations from natural disasters and otherwise. Um, but with the green card holders, they want to be Americans. And by serving in the military, that's a fast track for them to become citizens. And so they want to be citizens. They want to serve and earn their citizenship. Um, so I think the confidence in those men and women that put on the, the uniform once a month, you know, for a weekend, it's really, really high. At least from, from where I sit, it's really high, and it's very much appreciated. Thank you. Let's take a, a general HR on the private contractors, and then a final word from <laughs> Professor Peter and Secretary Jim. Okay, great. Hey, David, thanks for that question. I, you know, I, I think that you're raising a really important point. I think private contractors are a necessity now, but they ought to have roles that are narrowly circumscribed. Circumscribed to maybe logistics or you know, uh, or, you know, I mean, laundry, bath uh, facilities, you know, the kind of logistics facilities you need that you can really, uh, you can use soldiers for, uh, for other important tasks or for, uh, for those tasks in an expeditionary environment, you know. Uh, but, then, but then also they should never be put on offensive operations. And I would say that would include even security details for military personnel, for example. Uh, I'll just tell you one quick anecdote. Uh, in, in we, we went to, to the town of Hala, which is a, a mixed uh, place from, between Sunni and Shia populations, very contested area with, you know, a, 
great chief of police there who was ultimately killed uh, by, by uh, uh, Shia militias uh, uh, under the, you know, the influence and control of, of the, the Iranians. And when I, when I went to see him, we were moving through a crowd, and it was a private security company detail that came with me, because I was just a member of the staff then, and they were pushing Iraqis out of the way and screaming and yelling at them and had, you know, had, you know, sunglasses on and, and, and I, I, I yelled for them to stop, you know, and I pulled them in. I said, you're not, you're not going to behave this way, you know, uh, toward Iraqis. And they said, well, you're, you're with me. Like, you know, they acted like a, that it wasn't my call. And I said, I'm leaving right now, you know, if, if you continue this. They said they had to project intimidation, you know. And these are, these are, you know, people who maybe washed out of the service earlier, you know, and have great war stories to tell Uncle Bob at the barbecue, you know. But they, they weren't soldiers, in my view, <laughs> no. right? And, 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 and they were having a mission impact. So I think some of them, you know, a perimeter guard, right, gate guards, mm -hmm. that, that's, that, that's, that's worthwhile to employ them. But there are, there are certain roles that they're completely inappropriate to employ them on, and especially... Uh, those that, that where you expect soldiers, Marines, uh, you know, sailors and, and airmen to behave in a way that's consistent with our warrior ethos while they're in dangerous environments. I think uh, private security companies just can't, they can't do that. And, and then I think that applies to aid as well. You know, a lot of times we, we, we run aid by just contracting out to, you know, to service providers, right? And, and, uh, and, and oftentimes they don't operate as if they understand the competitions that are going, political competitions in this case, within, for example, government ministries and institutions. Yeah. We, get, we are too reliant on the quick, easy contract button. And then there are silly things. Can I say something really silly you know, about this? In, in Afghanistan, because of these stupid troop caps that we had for so long, hmm. we had situations where a US Army Aviation Brigade, the Secretary knows this well, would deploy to Afghanistan, leave its mechanics behind with no aircraft, hire really expensive maintenance uh, services for that aviation brigade, while the skills of those aviation mechanics are atrophying back at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Right? So, so, so I think that there are a lot of silly policies that are put in place at times that encourage the use of contractors uh, okay. in a way that is actually detrimental to the mission and detrimental to readiness. Yeah, Catch-22 wasn't written for nothing. That's we're going right. right. to have Professor exactly. Peter, and then we'll close out okay. with Secretary Jim. I would just say that the American public knows in theory about <laughs> the differences between the services, between the Guard, active and reserve, uh, and between active and retired, in theory. But they're actually not very good at discerning who is who and who's what. They don't know that the Navy is the finest service, for instance, and they don't know <laughs> <laughs> that the norms that govern active duty don't apply to retired. And that's why it's so dangerous uh, when we use the military in ways, whether they're uh, deployed in the homeland to, uh, to suppress civil uh, disorder, that will look like it's the military doing that, whichever group in uniform yes. is doing it. And that's why uh, his name is General, First name is General for the rest of his life. Yours is Secretary. No. I'm trying, but Secretary. <laughs> but General. So what General McMaster says in retirement gets folded in the American mind as that's what the military is saying. And that means that the military has to be much more careful about his public um, profile. And I'll close that. Secretary, Secretary Jim. Mattis. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Stephen did introduce me as General. People call me General. Once you're a general, you can't say, turn the hand of time back and say, I'm not one. You got to act like you're a general and keep your mouth shut in certain things. Uh, HR hit the nail on the head. If you want a limited war, limit your political ends that you're going for. Don't limit the military means to get there. Yeah. Because when you put these ridiculous troop caps on people, Pretty soon, you're putting our officers in a position where they have no reserves, they have to commit everyone, they have nothing to fall back on. Uh, we're, we're finding helicopters deployed with pilots and no mechanics. Who, who could think up something like that? Would any of you get on an airplane at San Francisco that had not been looked at by mechanics? I think not. So we've got we've to get over that sort of thing. But I think any time you're going to put a weapon in the hands of somebody 
overseas with the American imprint. Like, I, we, we were not in the U.S. Army. Excuse me, we were not in the Army or the Marine Corps. We were in the U.S. Army, the U.S. Marine Corps. We're answerable to you. And if we're going to draw down and take a life, I think that should be someone under our Constitution who's held accountable for firing that weapon. I don't like the idea of having contractors, besides which they have gotten us into a lot of trouble from the kind that uh, was just related here to four, and they're not all Americans, by the way. They're not subject to our authority in some cases. Have four contractors decide to drive, draw a straight line from Baghdad to a place called Tele, Telecom, and it went through a town called Fallujah. Mm -hmm. And we just turned over at the 82nd Airborne, and they said there's trouble, we had a great turnover. And they drove right into town, got killed, dismembered, burned, hung up on a bridge, international media showing it. And my whole military chain of command stood by me when I said, don't order us to attack a city with 350,000 innocent people and more terrorists than I have my Marines under this troop cap. Let me get the tribal. We have tribes in there that don't like who did it. We have their pictures. We'll hunt them down. We'll kill every one of them with a targeted raid. We'll get the bodies back for their loved ones, uh, get them home, uh, and that sort of thing. But the political leadership said, no, you will attack Fallujah. So we did it. But here we had four contractors not checking in with the Marine, just drawing a line, and dry, we call them combat tourists. And they all had guns, and they all got themselves killed. And then we had hundreds of soldiers, sailors, and Marines killed in charging into a city while we're still under troop caps. You can see where this goes, OK? So you want to, at certain points, you want to say, this is the political end state, and that's what our, our leaders need to set. And then you give the military the means to finish it as rapidly as possible. All the means they need, don't limit it. Don't limit that in a limited war. Stephen. Thank you. I've, um, I've mismanaged the time here as the mo my only duty. Um, <laughs> I failed to bring this to a responsible end. <laughs> We, overran we have a different form of warfare, far more kinetic as our next panel, universities and civic culture following immediately. <laughs>